I'm so excited today to tell you a little bit about what we've learned over the last few years about how the germline genome influences the way prostate cancers evolve, become aggressive, and ultimately, unfortunately, kill people. So we're going to start off with some background about the germline genome and why we think it's a really interesting space to study, then talk about what we've learned about how it influences the epigenome which is much more malleable than the tumor genome. And then we'll move directly to the cancer genome itself and then end off with some thoughts on where this is likely going next. So why study the germline genome? There are a number of different lines of evidence to support this idea, but I'll even start off explaining why it's a little surprising. You know, if you think about it, cancer is a disease of mutations, mutations that sequentially give a cell selective advantages and that those selective advantages eventually create something that is able to metastasize, spread to different parts of the body, and ultimately ends up killing its host. So why study the genome on which those mutations happen instead of the mutations themselves? Those mutations themselves are somatic, but what's interesting about the germline genome? Well, there are a few lines of evidence to suggest we should really look at it closely. The first is that if we study almost any cancer type, there are a series of syndromes which are germline predisposition or familial characteristics which make them likely to occur, make those cancers likely to occur. For example, RB1 mutations are tightly associated with retinoblastoma, or P53 germline mutations are tightly associated with uh, Lifraumeni. And in fact, that kind of gets to a broader point, which is that ultimately, any two cancers are more similar than any two people. People are more different than cancers are. If you take a look at a typical localized prostate cancer, it's got two to 3,000 point mutations, SNBs. By contrast, any two individuals who aren't consanguineous will have about 3 million germline polymorphisms distinguishing them. It's a thousand times more variability between people than tumors. And if we take a look at even metastatic cancers, it's still a hundred times more. And that's true even if we think about these gains and losses that are prototypic of cancers and, and rare in germline genomes, there's actually about 1% of the germline genome will have these structural variants in a typical individual, which compares pretty similarly to about 5% in a typical localized prostate cancer. If we focus on prostate cancer, several lines of evidence suggest that this germline information might be clinically important. For example, BRCA2 mutations are present in about 4% of newly diagnosed prostate cancers. There's about a four times increased risk of those patients having a, a relapse of their disease, and those tumors are thought to be much more likely to be sensitive to specific therapies. Equivalently, there are these things called PRSs, or polygenic risk scores, which take common variation that occurs at hundreds of sites around the genome. And a series of large consortia studies by a group called the Practical Consortia have shown that as many as 20% of prostate cancer biopsies might be avoided by just taking into account this relatively easily acquired germline information. Okay, so given that argument, then what do we know about how germline influences cancer evolution? Well, the first place that we sought to look was at methylation. These are marks that are laid down differently on the genome from tissue to tissue in the body. The epigenome kind of regulates how the genome is expressed from cell to cell. And we chose to look at that because we thought it was more malleable and therefore likely more cancer specific because not every cell of the body has the same epigenome. We looked at 400 tumors, germline whole genome sequencing to look at every single point mutation and somatic methylome. And then we validated it in about 450 tumors with uh, similar data. This work was led by Katie Houlihan, a PhD student who will be graduating in almost exactly a month today. And what she did was start off by looking at whether germline risk SNPs, those are SNPs that are associated with risk of reoccurrence of the tumor, so which individuals are more or less likely to get tumors, whether these are associated with specific somatic methylation. And you can see here, the columns are germline risk SNPs, and each of these rows with a red dot or a blue dot in a black background is a specific association between a germline SNP, which makes a man more likely to get diagnosed with prostate cancer, and methylation at a specific region in the genome. 
And we're incredibly able to validate every single one of those associations in that independent cohort. And so that gave us a lot of confidence that there might be a lot of these sitting out there undiscovered. So we did a genome-wide screen. You can see the genome laid out from chromosome one to X. And these p-values are telling you for each of these methylated loci, is there a germline SNP which is associated with it? And you can see these p-values, 10 to the minus 100, inferring that there's a one in 10 to the 100 chance that this is a false positive. Incredibly strong associations. To give you a sense of what these strong associations look like, you can see these data here. Just a couple of examples from that plot where you can see that the three possible SNPs, AA, AB, and BB, corresponding to two copies being the same, one copy of each allele, and two copies the same of the alternative allele, basically look entirely distinct. You know, methylation on the y-axis is almost completely determined by the germline SNP. And we found a lot of these. So we found 12,650 of these across the genome. And so we put these through a series of filters to really have high confidence on them. We required that they would be identified in both the discovery and the validation cohort. And then we require that they wouldn't be identified in two cohorts of normal prostate cancer. And this gives us about a normal prostate, not normal prostate cancer. And this gives us about 1,100 tumor MEQTLs, specific germline methylation loci that only occur in the tumor and not in the normal. A subset of these also affect RNA and protein and some of these only and specifically in tumor. So these are very large numbers of hits. And, and what characterizes this pool of say a thousand tumor MEQTL? Well, the first thing is they preferentially occur in something called in cancers, regions of the genome that are regulatory. And they appear to be preferentially changing the association of methylation and gene expression, which genes are turned on. And to give you an example for what this looks like, I'll blow out a a look at one specific gene, TSERG1L, which is a transcription elongation factor. You can see here that there's a single methylated locus in the five prime and another in the three prime, so on both ends of the gene, that is associated with a series of different germline SNPs in a tumor-specific fashion with the red dots and white, blue dots and white reflecting that. That preferentially affects enhancer activity and using something called H3K27, a settle mark, we can see that the BB allele, one of the two alleles, is very strongly associated with increased activity, suggesting increased gene expression. And incredibly, this SNP is prognostic. So we can see here that patients with that BB allele have remarkably better outcome than those that don't, telling us effectively that this is a mark of good prognosis prostate cancer or indolent prostate cancer that's unlikely to need aggressive treatment. Okay, so that's exciting, but truthfully, the epigenome is affected by so many things. It's affected by diet and exercise and even the time of the day, circadian rhythms affected. So can we take a look at something fixed and really get at the evolution of prostate cancer? So next, Katie's decided to focus on somatic mutations. And, you know, there's some good idea here that somatic mutations might be really important in the way that they're shaped by the germline genome. And that comes from the study of BRCA2 tumors. And this is a study of ours from about five years ago, where we looked at a set of 19 each of the columns, BRCA2 carriers. So these are patients who have a pathogenic germline BRCA2 mutation, and then they got prostate cancer. And what you can see here are the types of mutations that occur on them. And I'm just gonna focus your eye on this bar plot to the right in the top row for MYC. And you can see in the black bar that in BRCA2 mutant tumors, MYC is amplified 75% of the time. But in sporadic prostate cancers, only about 25% of the time. So here's an individual mutation that's three times more likely to be mutated in individuals who have a specific familial penetrance gene. And so that's remarkable. And that suggests that we should really be thinking about how we can look more broadly at germline influences in prostate cancer. And so what Katie did was consider a set of somatic driver mutations, those mutations that occur early-ish in tumor evolution and are known to make 
either the tumor more likely to occur or to become more aggressive. And she looked at about 60 of these. She profiled about 650 tumors with tumor whole genome sequencing and then validated it in a group of about 500 tumors, so large cohorts here. And you know, the takeaway message is fairly remarkable. Here you're seeing as the rows, individual driver mutations, as the columns, individual germline SNPs. And you can see that we've identified 43 germline SNPs that are associated with the occurrence of one or more individual somatic mutations. And that's telling you that to a substantive extent, individual somatic mutations are determined, their likelihood is biased by the characteristics of the host genome. So these aren't just randomly occurring, but instead they occur in a probabilistic way shaped by the host genome, by who the patient is. And it's not just in prostate cancer. For example, here's an individual germline SNP, which is associated with the frequency of an RB1 deletion. And you can see that it's associated with the frequency of RB1 deletion in our discovery cohort of about 650 patients, in our replication cohort of about 500, and here in a cohort of about 500 breast cancers with very similar odds ratios and characteristics. So these are large numbers and should really give us confidence that this is a real effect that's not just seen in prostate, but might be general of multiple cancer types. I misspoke, incidentally, the breast cancer cohort is about 130 patients, not about 500. And so that means that you can actually make some pretty good predictions about what's going to happen to an individual man's prostate cancer. Let's pretend that the only information that you had about a man was the germline SNPs that were present at birth. Well, from that, you could make a prediction about whether that man was going to get a Tempris 2 erg mutation in their tumor or not. That, that prediction would be about 70 to 75% accurate, far better by thin chance alone, not perfect. Hmm. Tempris 2 erg is not an actionable mutation in and of itself. It's interesting, but it's not something that's going to drive clinical decision making. But what it does tell you is that we can make predictions about a cancer years before it's diagnosed. And so if you kind of summarize that, it tells you almost immediately what we're thinking about. We're thinking that we need to understand how this influences cancers arising in different ancestries. And in particular at UCLA, we're really interested in tumors arising in individuals of Hispanic ancestry. We want to better understand how these germline influences shape gene expression, the transcriptome and the proteome. And we want to figure out how to integrate this information with existing diagnostic and prognostic tests like MRI imaging or urine or tissue-based assays. And of course, the real question is how should this influence decision-making if we can make predictions years and years before a man is likely to have a diagnosis, how should that influence screening or prevention measures? So all of this is a we, I'm a small part of a large team. We have lots and lots of close collaboration still in Canada where I was until a couple of years ago, a large set of emerging collaborations at UCLA. A fraction of my team is listed here, and I'm really happy to talk to you about some of what we've discovered. Thanks so much, and I'm looking forward to our discussion.